My life flows on in endless song Above earth's lamentation I hear the real, though far off hill That hails a new creation Through all the tumult and the strife I hear the music ringing, it sounds an echo in my soul, how can I keep from singing? What though the tempest round me roars, I know the truth it liveth. What Good morning, everyone, and welcome to virtual service with the Unitarian Universalist Church of Silver Spring. I'm Bruce McConaughey, today's worship associate, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. In the service of everyone's health and safety, we continue to worship in an online, online format here at the UU Church of Silver Spring. Our staff and volunteers continue to work hard at building community in this new way, and we are strengthening the many other connections that bind us together. Whether you are with us live or watching later, we're glad you're here. If you're watching live, please log in to Google to participate in the comments. To protect privacy, comments won't be available for those who tune in later, but during the service, keep in mind that comments are very public. Thanks to Scott Sleet for moderating the chat today. American Sign Language interpretation is available in a separate Zoom room. If you use ASL and need help finding that link, please ask in the chat or email vstechsupport at uucss.org to get the link. Thank you to Miyako Villanueva for ASL interpretation here and in the Zoom room. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our visitors from around the corner here in Silver Spring and from around the world. Mary Beth Lerner is our welcoming captain for the day and would be glad to answer your questions in the chat. Mary Beth will also be available during virtual coffee hour after the service. Another way to find information about this congregation or Unitarian Universalism is to send an email to membership at UUCSS. Dot org. In a couple of minutes, we will share in our chalice lighting and congregational commitment. So now is a good time for you to get your chalice or a candle or even a flashlight so you're ready when it's time for us all to light our flame together. But first, a special thank you to all of the volunteers and staff who made today's service possible. Thank you to Richard Lohr for being today's Sunday support volunteer and to Jan Harrelson for publicizing the service. 
Thank you to Annabelle and Steve Leet, our technical directors. Thanks to Joe Paletti for facilitating today's virtual coffee hour, and to Mary Beth for serving as our welcoming captain. Thank you to the musicians who contributed their time and talent for today's service. And thanks especially to the UUCSS staff team. Labor Day weekend is not an ordinary time, as we do not rush headlong into our usual labors. The sacred is found not only in houses of worship, but in time set apart. Let us turn our attention to what is sacred in our daily living. For the rewards of work and all those ancestors who boldly advocated for safety, fair wages, and better working conditions, we lift our hearts in gratitude. May this time energize us to bring forth an even more just and sustainable world. Now is the time to light our chalices. Let us know in the chat that you have lit your chalice and where you are. Please join me in the words on your screen as we light our chalices and reaffirm our congregational commitment. May this light warm our hearts with love and caring and guide us in the ways of truth. Now our congregational commitment. As we gather here for worship, we pledge ourselves to the endless search for truth, to the right of each to believe as mind, heart, and conscience dictate, to accept the responsibilities this freedom commands, and to implement our belief in the essential worth and dignity of every human being. May it be so. Let's sing together. The words to the hymn, Come Thou Fount, will appear on your screen. Once upon a time, there was a landowner 
who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed with the workers to give them a dinar a day, one coin, and sent them off to the vineyard. He went out again in the middle of the morning and saw some others standing in the marketplace with nothing to do. You too can go to the vineyard, he said, and I'll give you what's right. So off they went. He went out again about midday and then in the middle of the afternoon and did the same. Then, with only an hour of the day left, he went out and found other people standing there. Why are you standing here all day with nothing to do, he asked them. Because no one has hired us, they replied. Well, he said, you too can go into the vineyard. When evening came, the vineyard owner said to his servant, Call the workers and give them their pay. Start with the last and go to the first. So the ones who had worked for one hour came, and each of them received a dinar, one coin. When the first ones came, they thought they would get something more, but they too each received a dinar. When they had been given it, they grumbled against the landowner. This lot who came last, they said, have only worked for one hour, and they've been put on a level with us, and we did all the hard work, all day, and in the heat as well. My friend, he said to one of them, I'm not doing you any wrong. You agreed with me on one dinar, didn't you? Take it, it's yours, and be on your way. I want to give those who came at the end the same as you, or are you suggesting that I'm not allowed to do what I like with my own money? And then, they all had a dance party. This morning, as we tune in from our kitchen tables and living room couches, we give thanks for this time and space to be together. Yet for many of us, this is also a time of sadness, of yearning to be back together in person. Since we cannot lean into one another's arms right now, we lean into the other things that draw us close, that connect us one to another and with that which is greater. If you're joining us live this morning, I invite you to type your joys and sorrows into the chat box during the music. Keep in mind that everything shared in the chat box is public during the live stream of this service. Lately, it seems like we have a lot of joys and sorrows to share, which means our joys and sorrows chat is full and fast moving. So if you'd welcome a conversation around the sorrow or concern you share today, please email layministers at uucss.org and let them know that you need support. If you're watching this as a recording later, please take this time to practice gratitude and to hold in loving compassion all those in your life and our world who are in need.
spirit of mourning has fallen on our communities, on our country, as precious friends and loved ones lose their lives and suffer the many other impacts of twin pandemics, COVID-19 and racism. These flames are symbols of a long history of injustice and our commitment as a community to honor all who have suffered and died due to inadequate health care, valuing profits over public health and white supremacy. We mourn for the many whose lives and bodies will never be the same after falling ill with this virus or experiencing racial violence. We mourn all those who have died. We grieve that our society has come to accept this suffering and death as inevitable. In the silence, let us honor those whose lives have been lost and pray for the spirit of truth and love to guide us and our nation into the peace that is only possible in the presence of justice. Amen. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit drawn Radical Gratitude Spell by Adrienne Marie Brown. You are a miracle walking. I greet you with wonder in a world which seeks to own your joy and your imagination. You have chosen to be free every day as a practice. I can never know the struggles you went through to get here but I know you have swum upstream and at times it has been lonely. I want you to know I honor the choices you made in solitude and I honor the work you have done to belong. I honor your commitment to that which is larger than yourself and your journey to, the, to love the particular container of life that is you. You are enough. Your work is enough. You are needed. Your work is sacred. You are here and I am grateful. Well, happy Labor Day weekend, everyone. 
Most years, our family looks forward to a cookout on Labor Day or a trip to the beach. And while social distancing means we won't be able to do those things this year, we are looking forward to a lazy Monday morning without having to worry about getting signed in for virtual school. But Labor Day is about more than swimming and cookouts and sleeping in. It's a day set aside to honor the work and sacrifices of unions and the labor movement. It's one day every year when we're invited to remember that things like the standard work week, overtime pay, parental leave, and workplace protections were not given to us by big business or the government. People risked life and limb to fight for them. I'm very grateful for the good work the labor movement has done, but every year when this holiday weekend rolls around, I think about the people who don't enjoy the benefits that labor worked so hard to secure. I remember the women I've known who've been fired when their bosses learned they were pregnant. I remember when I worked retail and sometimes didn't get paid for my overtime work. I think of the people who pick the fruits and vegetables we eat, people who make their living on tips and driving for Uber, and the prisoners in California who fight the wildfires there every year. Labor Day seems especially poignant this year when an unprecedented number of people are out of work, even while the stock market is soaring. This year when the gap between the wealthy and everybody else is as big as it's ever been, and as the rise of the gig economy robs more and more workers of rights, protections, and stable pay. There are some pretty striking parallels between our world today and the world Jesus and his friends and followers lived in. The parable that we watched together during our time for all ages this morning lifts up some of those parallels. I think that's one of the reasons why I find myself coming back to this parable again and again. Jesus told parables to his friends and followers to help them think critically about their world. And just as it does for us today, this parallel would have raised questions about how we choose to value work and what makes a person deserving or undeserving of work and compensation. Like so many passages in sacred texts, there's a traditional way of reading this story. And there is power in that traditional reading. By giving each worker the same pay, regardless of how long they worked, the vineyard owner seems to affirm something in those workers beyond their labor. By paying all of them what was considered at the time a fair day's wage, he seems to affirm something akin to our faith's first principle. As Luther Seminary professor Dr. Matthew Skinner writes, in the end, it's not just about unfair payments. At the parable's conclusion, the full day workers don't moan that they've been cheated. They complain instead to the landowner, you have made them, the one hour workers, equal to us. It's not the generosity or the extravagance that makes them angry. Rather, the issue is this, by dealing generously with a group of people that no other manager in town considered worthy of the trouble of hiring, the landowner has made a clear declaration about their value, their worth. Our faith teaches us that our worth is not based on how many grapes we picked today. And this way of reading this story affirms the worth and preciousness of every person apart from their ability to produce profit. It suggests that regardless of how much or little a person can work, they are of equal worth. This way of reading the parable supports the theology that the world we dream about, the reality that Jesus called the kingdom of God, starts with what people need, with what is just, and not with what labor they have to offer or some sense of their merits. 
This way of reading the story is good news for many people. It's good news to people who cannot work for whatever reason. It's good news for people dedicated to increasing the minimum wage. It's good news to people with less privilege, people left outside of the meritocracy because they were never given opportunities to show their merits in the first place. As we enter into a time of reflection together, let's think about this parable and our first principle. What would a world organized around people's needs, people's worth, instead of their ability to generate profit look like?
the traditional reading of our parable is compelling, but it's not the only way to approach it. In the traditional reading, the owner of the vineyard represents God, a loving God who generously cares for the needs of all equally, regardless of how much work they were able to do. And yet, at the end of the day, the laborers are still just day laborers, workers in a gig economy where the land stays in the possession of the rich. And the landowner, he stays rich and in a position to easily exploit small differences between workers so that they pose no threat to his status. But here's the thing. Jesus told parables as a way to try and help his friends and followers imagine the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like a vineyard owner, he'd say, and then tell the parable. But how on earth could this story with these troubling layers possibly point us toward the beloved community? As progressive Christian blogger D. Mark Davis asks, how are we to encounter a parable that is built on a structurally unjust scenario. In sacred texts, we are often have to look to the passages right before and right after the one we're studying to get more information. So it's interesting to notice that Jesus tells our parable right after another exchange you might be more familiar with. A rich man comes to Jesus and asks him what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus tells him he must sell all that he has and give it to the poor. And the rich man goes away weeping, for he had many possessions. But wait, in the first exchange, the wealthy are supposed to give away everything to the poor. And in the second one, a rich man is compared to God for being generous with wealth that he holds on to. So maybe the point here is bigger than either story could convey alone. The animation of this parable that we watched was wonderful, but it left out perhaps the most important sentence of the story. At the end of telling this parable, Jesus says, so the last will be first and the first will be last. I think maybe Jesus was trying to teach his friends and followers that the world we all dream about the beloved community, what he called the kingdom of God, it has no place for a sense of entitlement or superiority. Years ago, in a conversation with friends, I mentioned that I was supporting work to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. One of my friends was horrified and said, but if we raise the minimum wage to $15, then a person flipping burgers will make the same as an EMT. Just like the workers in the vineyard, the problem wasn't the amount of money itself. It wasn't even that EMTs ought to be making way more than that in the first place. The problem was making burger flippers and EMTs economic equals. The problem was the effort to disrupt a system that does everything it can to keep the first first and the last last. Never mind that there is simply no moral justification for anyone to make less than a living wage in a country with so many billionaires. This sense that some people are more entitled than others that some work is more deserving of a living wage than other work, that we must earn our worth through labor or wealth. This set of ideas is everywhere. And it is this deeply rooted and deeply warped sense of entitlement that holds up a lot of structural inequality and racism in this country, just as it did in Jesus's time and place. I guess this is also related to why so many people paid attention when professional athletes chose to withhold their labor last week to protest police brutality. It's been interesting to observe people whose great grandfathers led strikes to protest unfair treatment, 
bemoan athletes today using the same strategy to protest police brutality. Our political system empowers the wealthy to use their money and power to influence politics all the time. That's literally what lobbyists and super PACs do. But when athletes of color refuse to play, it challenges white America's sense of entitlement to their labor. And as Abraham Kahn wrote a few days ago in an article in The Conversation, what began with the Milwaukee Bucks in Orlando signals a new form of athlete activism, not because the platform is growing or the arguments are becoming more convincing, but because it eschews the trappings of symbolic spectacle. The players are leveraging labor power to accomplish real political work. If we in America on Labor Day weekend in 2020 are to take anything away from Jesus's 2000 year old parable of the vineyard workers, I think it's this. The laborers in the vineyard had a lot more in common than they had dividing them, just as workers do today. The wealthy and powerful have long exploited small differences between workers to keep them divided. And it is the warped sense that some workers are superior to others because of how much or how long they work, because of how much profit they make, because of the color of their skin or where they were or weren't born. It is that warped sense that keeps unfair systems in place. This Labor Day weekend, may we remember that no matter what messages the world might give us, no matter what our supervisors at work might tell us, our worth and the worth of every human being is not something that needs to be earned. It is inherent to our humanity. May we remember that the forces at work dividing us are not new and they are not inevitable. May we use this holiday as an opportunity to imagine a reality based on something other than merit and reward for labor. A reality where people's needs are met apart from their ability or inability to work. For in order for something to become reality, it must be imaginable first. And may we remember as Adrienne Marie Brown writes, that we are enough. Our work is enough. We are needed. Our work is sacred. We are here. And for that, let us be grateful. Amen. The Unitarian Universalist Church of Silver Spring is a living community with a rich heritage and a purposeful future. Here are some pictures of our church community in pre-COVID times to remind us of our covenant with each other. We are strong and adaptable today because of the past commitments of members and friends. During the offertory, there are three ways you can make your financial gift to the congregation. You could download the Give Plus mobile app from Vanco to set up an account. Second, you can use your phone to text a message to 833-880-1363. And next on your screen are instructions for both of those options. Third, if neither the app nor texting works for you, we recommend that you support the U.S. Post Office by mailing your check directly to the church. Please mark your envelope, Attention, collector. As a community, we need each other now more than ever. Please give as generously as you are able. As we make our gifts, we give thanks to our musicians for this musical accompaniment. Blessed be the nation. Blessed be the nation, blessed be the nation, 
we have given and received fuel the flame of our commitment and help us to live out our mission to help nurture our spirits and heal our world. Good morning, everyone. I am Carl Miller. I am with the Board of Trustees at UUCSS. My pronouns are he, him, and his. 
Thank you for being here today. We are thrilled this morning to introduce our new Religious Education Coordinator, Lindsay Cowett. Hello UUCSS, my name is Lindsay Cowett and I am the new uh, Religious Education Coordinator. I am very excited to be joining the congregation and I'm very excited to be working with um, everyone of all ages in the group and getting to know you all for now virtually and hopefully one day in person. Um, I have a lot of experience working with the spiritual formation of children and youth and young adults, so I'm looking forward to continuing that work here. Um, I did a bit of a more professional introduction in my part of the newsletter, so I wanted to share some more personal information about me as I start my time uh, with this congregation. First, I am married. My husband Bryce and I have been married for coming up three years now in October. We are also the parents to two adorable cats, Sparky and Domino, and we love to spoil them immensely. I also love to share photos and stories of them on a regular basis, so if you ever want to see what they look like or hear any funny tidbits from them, just send me an email. I'm happy to tell you all about them. I am mixed race. I am white and Arabic, specifically Palestinian Jordanian. And I know that that is something I'm very um, invested in and is a big part of my identity. So I look forward to bringing those aspects of myself to my time here. I am also a real big geek. So if you want to talk about theology or various types of fandoms and anything in between, I will very happily talk about it and probably for a long period of time. So thank you for having me be part of your congregation. I'm really excited to start our time together. And if you have any questions about me or any plans we have, please just uh, send me an email. The email is listed on the newsletter. Um, thank you again for having me here. I'm very excited. Welcome, Lindsay. Families can register for religious education on our website, uucss.org. The program will start on September 20th. More details can be found on the website and in our Lifespan Religious Education newsletter, which was sent out over email last week. We give thanks for all of the activities that enrich and enliven our congregational life. Our church is a vibrant community of volunteers and staff, and visitors are welcome at our virtual coffee hour after the service to learn more about us. Yeah. 
those of you watching live, the link to get you to our virtual coffee hour will appear on your screen after the service. If you have a chalice near you, get ready to extinguish it, and let us know in the chat that you will carry the flame. Please join me in the words of our chalice extinguishing. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. As Adrienne Marie Brown writes, I want you to know I honor the choices you made in solitude, and I honor the work you have done to be long. I honor your commitment to that which is larger than yourself and your journey, to love the particular container of life that is you. You are enough. Your work is enough. You are needed. Your work is sacred. You are here, and I am grateful. Amen.